when Einstein was developing general relativity, every other physicist still firmly believed in Newtonian mechanics. After all, it had never been disproved. Even when the meticulous observation of the trajectory of Uranus seemed to disprove Newton, physicists boldly kept faith in Newton and rather explained this anomaly by the existence of an eighth planet of the solar system. They were right and Neptune was discovered. This dramatic success made Newton's mechanics unquestionable. So, when a small anomaly in the trajectory of Mercury was detected, no one questioned Newton. For one thing, this anomaly was extremely small, almost non-existent. Plus, it seemed like it could be explained by the existence of some small unobserved asteroids close to the Sun. Nevertheless, the bold young Einstein asked, what if this anomaly was not due to some unobserved objects? What if instead this was a hint that Newton's mechanics was failing close to the Sun? Most importantly, what if I could prove that my theory of general relativity supersedes Newton's mechanics by showing that it can explain this Mercury anomaly that Newton can't. In 1912, Einstein came to Zurich to work with the mathematician Marcel Grossman on an equation through which energy tells space-time how to curve. Early on, Grossman proposed an equation, but both he and Einstein ended up rejecting it because it didn't seem to explain the planetary motions that Newton did. Instead, Einstein cooked up his own equation. However, overwhelmed by the extreme difficulty of the computations, Einstein failed to derive the trajectory of Mercury from his equation. Nevertheless, since it successfully merged the special relativity and the equivalence principle, Einstein and Grossman were actually quite pleased with the theory. And thus they published it in 1913 and they asked experimenters to put the theory to the test by chasing solar eclipses. Crucially, Newton's gravity only affects massive objects and thus doesn't apply to light, which has no mass. However, in Einstein's theory, gravity curves space-time and it is the curving of space-time that affects the motion of objects. But since light travels through space-time as well, the curving of space-time will affect light as well and therefore light is spent near the Sun. In particular, when we observe a solar eclipse, the positions of the stars in the dark sky should differ from their positions at night. And it is this deviation that would confirm Einstein's theory. Unfortunately, solar eclipses are rare and they only occur at very particular locations on Earth. Moreover, the First World War broke all over Europe. This deeply slowed the progress of the expeditions that planned to confirm or disprove Einstein. This was a bummer for Einstein. How was it? Ironically, the failure of the early test of his theory turned out to be a miracle for Einstein's career. Indeed, in 1915, while experimenters still couldn't perform their observations, Einstein realized that his computations were flawed. In a rush, he searched for a fix for his theory. Meanwhile, Hilbert, who learned about Einstein's progress, Rest him and try to find the equation that would imply the observed trajectory of Mercury. Einstein must have been deeply stressed. He worked hard, very hard, but he still couldn't figure it out. His own theory of gravity seemed to be slipping through his hands. Times and times and again, he thought he had it, but still found another mistake in his calculations. And there was the constant threat that Hilbert would scoop him. In an act of despair, he went back to Grossman's proposed equation, understood that the arguments he rejected were actually unsound, and slightly modified it to guarantee the conservation of energy. He stared at this equation and understood its extreme beauty, its extreme naturalness. Next, he tried to work out the trajectory of Mercury from it. This was a very tough task. He spent days and nights performing his calculations over and over again, and again and again, and again. Again and again until out of the room. He got it! 
After pages of abstract and difficult computations, Anshan had derived Mercury's trajectory. At last, he had in his hands a theory that better describes planetary motions than Newton's mechanics does. He was right! He had triumphed! For the following days, he had a dangerous heart palpitations due to his extreme excitement. He wrote, The years of anxious searching in the dark, with their intense longing, their intense alternations of confidence and exhaustion, and the final emergence into the light, only those who have experienced it can understand it. We have never been anywhere close to this kind of amazing achievement that Anshan was referring to. This quote strongly resonates with me when I'm doing mathematics, when I'm learning mathematics, when I'm learning Anshan's general relativity. Most of the time, I feel lost. I just don't understand what's going on. But then, sometimes, out of the blue, something just clicks in my mind and it's just it's just amazing you then have a rush of ideas through your head and everything becomes crystal clear and i would argue that perhaps the main problem in mathematical education is that most students never experience this amazing feeling years later sir eddington would confirm einstein's theory through observations of eclipses Somehow, it seems that Einstein found this almost anecdotal. The Mercury anomaly had already convinced him of the validity of his theory, but for the rest of the world, this was a big, big deal. While still mourning the devastating aftermaths of World War I, medias and people all over the world suddenly found a reason to smile as they celebrated the downfall of Newton's old laws and the rise of Einstein's revolutionary new theory of space, time and gravity. It is out of this unique excitement in the history of science that a new generation of physicists would emerge and develop today's counterpart of Einstein's general relativity, the theory of quantum mechanics. But that's for another time. Since then, Einstein's general relativity has been confirmed times and times again. Gravity probe B showed that a gyroscope in orbit twists along the curving of space-time, exactly as prescribed by Einstein, while measurements of delays of light beams sent from the bottom of skyscrapers to the tops revealed gravitational time dilation. And there are still many more ongoing tests of Einstein's theory. The bottom line is, our confidence today in Einstein's theory is so great that we now use it to weigh galaxies through gravitational lensing and to fix our global positioning system. But in the last decade, new observations of the cosmos are proving Einstein wrong. On one hand, galaxies seem to be spinning faster than we thought, while distant galaxies seem to accelerate away from us. This suggests that at galaxy scales, gravity is stronger than Einstein predicted, but on intergalactic scales, gravity curves space-time in the opposite sense than what Einstein claimed. So does that mean that Einstein was wrong? Well, somehow, like a hundred years ago, when faced with the anomaly of the trajectory of Mercury, physicists are actually trusting Einstein's theory over anything else, and thus, they searched for an explanation, not in the theory, but in some unobserved object in the universe. At the scale of galaxies, this unobserved object is called dark matter, and at the scale of the cosmos, of the entire universe, we call it dark energy. But these are really unobserved matter and energy, like we don't know at all what they are. We just figured out that if they are there, Everything in Einstein theory would work perfectly well with the observations. However, if history is to repeat itself, these large-scale anomalies might be hints that a new, deeper and more revolutionary theory of gravity is yet to be found. Hey, so I hope you've enjoyed this video. Now I've finally got a lot of comments on this video. I'm very excited about that. I was very, very happy to get 
your messages so i'm going to answer them personally so msj i'm not sure i'm pronouncing it right but anyways he's puzzled by the fact that electromagnetism is so strong well it has to do with the how atoms don't want to be crunched down to be put close to one another and that's because electrons uh, only have so much space around the the atoms that they can be in it has to do with quantum mechanics and the Pauli exclusion principle uh, there's a minute physics video that uh, I recommend to better understand what's going on here Michael Jamelliaro is asking what if we put two apples on the, the opposite sides of the earth they're going to be falling because the ground is accelerating upwards to them and so the earth seems to be expanding right well this is a question that we already discussed in a previous episode on the one on the curvature of space time and the explanation is the curvature of space time now in some comments like in Lester Ford's comments and Jose Miguel Santiana Nunez I felt like there was still a bit of ambiguity here about the, the relationship between acceleration and space-time curvature. As I'm really trying to stress it in the video, these two are largely unrelated. Like you really at, the, at all scale, there is no space-time curvature. Like if you're talking about what's going on in our daily lives, you should forget about space-time curvature. But maybe this can help a little bit. Acceleration is a very local phenomenon. It's only defined for two objects that are very very close to each other otherwise if you take uh, an apple at one end of uh, the, the earth and uh, an apple on the other end the concept of acceleration here cannot be defined because these two apples will not be on the same in the same uh, frame of reference like it, there's no global frame of reference so you cannot really compare the acceleration between the two you could but it's not a very natural way of doing that really when I'm talking about acceleration especially in the equivalence principle the acceleration I'm talking about is the acceleration of a local frame of reference and at this point curvature plays no role but don't feel bad about that general relativity is very very difficult you're thinking about this and this means that you're on the right track of all your comments are very supportive and i'm really really thankful for that it really gives me the motivation that i need to make uh, this video and the future videos so next time we're going to talk about einstein's uh, biggest blunder as i'm going to ask you the question what is the destiny of the universe and what does this have to do with general relativity Please think about it and I hope I'll see you next time.